Good morning, and it's a pleasure for me to be here, and um, it's really good to see a lot of my friends and colleagues here, and I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, so June 30th, uh, Dominic Mays, who many of you know, City of uh, Portland um, employee, and uh, a very good uh, botanist and naturalist, he um, noticed dead and dying ash trees in the parking lot of Joseph Gale Elementary School, and he reported the same day to our forest entomologist, Christine Buell, and Christine, living in Portland area, she was able to visit it the same day. So that was a very quick response, both by Dominic and by Christine. This is what the trees look like. Looking up, uh, there were 16 of them. Um, they were all the narrow leaf ash from Europe. Um, five of them were completely dead, and the others had 40 to 9% um, canopy decline. They're about five to nine inches in diameter. Um, and then they all had these classic signs of emerald ash borer. Uh, the bark was peeling. We could see galleries right under the bark. I visited the site the very next day on July 1st. And um, within 24 hours, these are our trap catches. So 285 beetles were caught in this trap right here. And the purple panel traps, they're less attractive, but we caught dozens of them. All those trees I just showed you have been removed. And thanks to Oregon Department of Agriculture and their contractors, uh, those trees have been removed and dealt with. And then in August 4th, um, ODA hosted our first EAB task force. Um, so we initiated our response plan at that point. So pretty quick response in my opinion. And so what is this EAB task force? At last count, there are over 40 agencies uh, representing local, state, federal, uh, nonprofits, industry, uh, individual landowners. Over 40 entities are now involved in this. Uh, it's, it's led by ODA, coordinated through Oregon Invasive Species Council. A lot of membership, as I mentioned been meeting monthly, and the work is now split into these seven subcommittees. I happen to be on several of these as well, but it's pretty nice that these subcommittees are tasked, they meet on their own, and then they come back monthly and report back to the task force, and then we're kind of set the direction for the next month. It's amazing how much work has been done in just 11 months. So here's that spot EAB survey that ODA and um, quickly got on, a very, very good tool to have. So it's a survey one, two, three form, and it's a visual survey. So it's an individual tree by tree survey, and it can be conducted uh, 12 months all year round based on the signs and symptoms that the tree is exhibiting. It's for approved agencies only, USDA and ODA and ODF. We've trained some people on how to identify an ash tree. That's step one, uh, because I only tax ash trees. And step two, how to identify if this uh, EAB or something else like sap sucker or other damage. And so, um, and then ODA got some emergency funding from the state legislature. They've been mapping trees like crazy. A lot of kudos needs to go to ODA, who's been organizing this data. And it is, this dashboard is publicly available. So the survey is not publicly available. You have to go through training, but the, the results are publicly available. That most of the positives are in the, in the city limits. But we also have some that have escaped into the natural areas outside. And these are going to be our um, pathways into neighboring communities. I just want to point out, keep your eyes on this Fern Hill. This is a property managed by Clean Water Services. There's a Tualatin River right here. And then Gales Creek comes out of the coast range and merges with the Tualatin River right here. So this is looking north right here. Uh, forest groves over here, Cornelius. And then in here is the Tualatin River. You can't see the river because it's crowded with ash canopy. Almost all these trees, especially the light-colored ones, uh, are ash trees right here. So if you can imagine this canopy being lost in three to five years, that's conceivably what could happen here. And uh, just recently, there's been some positives in this area. So here's Fern Hill right here. Got about eight positives, I think. And then there's one right on the Twelton River. So a lot of potential for EAB to spread. So Fraxis latifolia occurs on the west side. This is very, very common scene across the Lama Valley. When you're flying in the airplane, you can see this highly fragmented altered landscape that we have altered over the last 150 years. This is how um, EAB is going to move into our communities, is through these riparian corridors. We also have these ash swales, or wetlands, ash forests. And um, you do see this when you're flying, too, just um, these wetlands. Are, uh, this is the Grand Ronde. Um, a reservation just west of Salem. Uh, but there, you do find these throughout the Willamette Valley, too. And these are like refuges of habitat for, uh, I've seen elk in some of these, um, all kinds of wildlife, and native understory plants. So these are under threat, too. Mostly in 
below 500 feet elevation, but it can go up over 5,000 feet, as we're finding out in southern Oregon. Oregon ash goes all the way down south to the California border, and it grows in these a lot of different habitat types. So high elevation, as I mentioned, up to 5,000 feet. This is Ashland down here in the valley, and so very dry, uh, Walker Creek, very dry site. This is a dry, there's no water in that stream right now. Uh, also, the Umpqua Rivers, so another major river system, uh, both the North and South Forks, which go up high into the Cascades. It is a pretty widespread tree once you start looking for it. Uh, and so what does it co-occur with? A lot of other trees. So the big question is, what can I plant in place of ash? You can expect if you don't do anything, a lot of these places are going to transition from tree overstory to shrub overstory. But there are limited management options. We can release biological control agents and we can inject individual trees. Uh, this insecticide works very good, by the way. If you catch it early, you have to, it's more of a preventative thing. You have to, um, the tree canopy loss has to be less than 30% and you can protect that tree um, over 95% effective. But there's some drawbacks to applying pesticides. So one of the points I want to drive home is there's no chance to eradicate this, sadly. Um, it's never been eradicated. Over 20 eradication attempts from my last count, funded by the USDA, millions, tens of millions of dollars is spent trying to eradicate this pest. It was first detected in Detroit. And uh, you know, within 10 years, you can see how fast it spread. And this is despite aggressive um, eradication attempts. We have 16 North American Braxton species, five of them are threatened with extinction. So over 100 million trees killed, and I think it's 36 states now. One of the management techniques that we're doing here in Oregon, slam slowing ash mortality. And so this is a, the best proven management that we have from Eastern US. In fact, we've had experts from the Eastern US come out and, and help us. Basically, ODA set up what they're calling a, a ring of fire. Around this ring of fire, um, they're, ask, they're cooperating with landowners and, and property managers like Clean Water Services and Metro and uh, Tualatin Soil Water Conservation and tons of individual property owners. They're, girdle, they're picking out trees to girdle. That makes them very, very attractive. If you girdle a tree like this, the emerald ash borers, if they're flying around, they get sucked into that. And then you can fall those trees later or um, you can inject neighboring trees with that insecticide. And so if they attack a neighboring tree, they'll encounter that. It's a contact insecticide, they'll die. And this is the best way we can slow the spread down. So this is sort of the ring of fire right here. The blue is where trees have been selected. Uh, red is where we're still, they're still trying to develop some contact with those landowners. But they're trying to get a ring around uh, forest growth. And so, within here, but there are hundreds of trees that have been marked for girdling and insecticide injections, and that work is going on right now. Biological control, if done prop properly, is very, very safe. Um, this is work that was started many years ago by the USDA APHIS, and our eastern states, they uh, imported these different wasps and done host range testing to make sure they don't attack any of our native insects. They've been deemed safe, and now they're released in eastern US, and they provide about 30% predation on EAB. Unfortunately, it's not enough to um, stop exponential growth, but it does slow it down. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, the quarantine or what's called the control area. And so this just came out in the last couple of days here, last week or so. And one reason why ODA is a lead agency is because they're the regulatory agency for the state. So basically what the quarantine is saying is uh, no movement of ash material out of Washington County, no movement of ash logs, green lumber, nursery stock, mulch, firewood. But there are now some exceptions. This is their new rule, and there are some exceptions if that material, like the nursery stock and the wood products, the wood material is inspected. Uh, and so they have to enter into an individual compliance agreement. So you have to contact the ODA if you want to move ash material out of Washington County, and you have to sign something called the compliance agreement, and you're on the hook. If you're found responsible, there's going to be some penalties involved. So what are these approved treatments uh, for EAB chipping to one inch by one inch, uh, maximum dimension in, in, in two dimensions? Meat treatment, which is a little bit higher than the national standard, the national standard is at just a little bit lower temperature. So this, they've raised the bar on this. They really want to make sure that the wood is sanitized before it leaves. And this is mostly for firewood. Okay, so think about firewood producers, a commercial firewood producer. They have to kiln dry at least to 
170 for 60 minutes. Uh, for logs and other large uh, green material, if you want to remove it for like milling or something like that, transport it to a mill, it has to be demarked, uh, debarked and remove one inch of sapwood, which is pretty hard to do. Uh, burial obviously is safe, uh, burning, and then other, if you read the secondary processing into wood byproducts like paper, fiber, wood pellets. Uh, so why, why not move ash wood? What's the danger of moving ash wood? It's because EAB spends a significant amount of time in the sapwood, up to about an inch in the sapwood. So most of the time the larvae are feeding right in that vascular cambium, in that phloem, like a bark beetle. They're eating all the sugars. But towards the end of the larval stage, they will tunnel into the wood where they pupate. And they're getting ready to turn into an adult. But they spend months in there months over winter. So this is the time when if you have a sick tree that's been dying for the last two or three years, you drop it and you tell your cousin in Eugene, I've got some great ash firewood. Do you want some? <laughs> and uh, so that's how it's transported right there. The, the pre pupae are in the, the wood and then, uh, so then it, it warms up and adults emerge and now they're off to start a new population. So the guidelines are, from May 1st, October 15th, avoid moving ash. That's our guidelines here. Um, and if you do have to remove an ash, like as a hazard tree that threatens power lines, other infrastructure, then our recommendation is to treat it on site. We don't want to be moving this stuff in this window, so get an arborist to come in there and remove it and ship it on site. That's the best way to do it. Uh, but then kind of safer time is uh, right here, October 16th, April 30th. That's when the insect's dormant. You can remove it then, and it's a little bit safer to move it around. You can stack it for uh, a month or more. It, the important part is to process that before May 1st, before we have these critical temperature thresholds where the adults emerge. And then we developed a statewide plan. Ripley was one of the authors, myself, a lot of other people contributed to this. And it was first published in 2018 and then revised in 2021 lives online, but the bottom line is communities need to start preparing for it. So we are now doing our trapping season, and this is one of the uh, projects that ODF is coordinating. Uh, APHIS supplies all the trap components, and then we have them kind of in our storage at ODF, and uh, so communities can reach out to us and say, I want to put 10 or 15 traps on our property. And we have a web map and a survey form. And so City of Salem, uh, Willamette Mission State Park, uh, Twelton, uh, Soil Water Conservation District, uh, and I know I'm missing some other people, but other agencies have started um, putting traps out there and using our web map. And so everyone can see in real time any positives that show up in these traps. So we're going to keep doing this coordination at ODF. We developed this training program for natural resource professionals, at least how to identify it. Um, and report it. The Oregon Forest Pest Detectors, in my opinion, is a huge success. It was really thanks to Amy Grata, who sadly passed away in 2019. She was uh, the creator of this program, and I was very fortunate to work with her. Her legacy is still living on right now, um, right now to this day. People in this room have been affected by her work. And basically, it's a training program for professionals, um, and you can still take this training, by the way. It's free one hour long it's kind of hard to get to it but if you follow the breadcrumbs you go here you can you can find the training it takes about an hour it's very interactive and you can also get a society of american foresters credit if you pay a little fee you can get some saf credits as well and i also want to recognize brandy safel who was the coordinator for a long time and worked with amy brandy is now actually coincidentally works for twalton so She's in ground zero. So she's a very good person to have in ground zero because she's been working with EAB education and survey for a long time as well. Uh, but for the Oregon Ash Seed Project, um, we were interviewing people. We interviewed a lot of people for this plan right here, uh, some of our Eastern US counterparts. And I think it was three sets of states we interviewed. But we asked them all the same question, what would you have done differently? And they all said, we wish we would have collected seeds. We have no seed bank. Uh, we couldn't believe how fast it went through our state. We don't have any seeds. Like, oh, okay, so what else can we do? Uh, we said, well, let's try to collect seeds. And 
I applied for a grant from the Forest Service. It got funded, and five employees went across the state in three or four years, and we collected a lot of seeds, and we sent them to these uh, facilities, Darena, which does research on breeding resistance to invasive insects and diseases, uh, Fort Collins, which is just a long-term uh, seed bank um, for genetic preservation, like a seed vault, and then Ames, Iowa, and this Ames, Iowa is like the library for all the Eastern US researchers. They can uh, check out seeds or get seeds from our collections and start growing them. And I am proud to say that from 2019, we have Oregon ash seeds that are being grown in Delaware by a researcher. And they're actively trying to breed resistance, classical breeding. So uh, looking for resistance for EAB. The hope is that at some point we'll have an EAB resistant Praxis latifolia that we can put back on the landscape. So we, here's a web map, and I do have a public web map down here, but these are all the locations where ODF collected seeds. It's all from all four major ecoregions where Fraxis thalifolia exists. We did 27 populations and 243 mother trees that were tagged. We can go back to these trees, and almost a million seeds were collected. Okay, so we're here for urban forestry, and of course, EAB is an urban forest pest, and this is also from July 1st. This is in the Metal Lark Apartments, just north of the school here, where um, there's several um, ash that have been infested. So, landscaping tree, again, this narrow leaf ash, uh, angustifolia, I think it is, practice angustifolia, the raywood ash, heavily planted across the Lima Valley in our urban areas, very susceptible to EAB, and I'm guessing that these were all planted at the same time, but you could see the size difference. So this tree has probably been infested for two or three years, and the canopy is declining right here. It just hasn't grown very well. Uh, I didn't think this tree was infested, but I believe later someone did find found some, um, some exit holes, and these trees have been removed, by the way, but you can see the differences in growth. And the cost eventually is gonna be put on these property owners. Right now, I think there was some emergency funds that were paid for this. This re these removals, the ODA administered that. This is sort of the worst case scenario, probably seeing this picture right here, so I just want you to note the time right here, 2006, and these are all uh, ash trees along the street, and so three years later, same street. So it's a very powerful insect. It does move faster than you might think, and um, for these landowners, their house, if it were worth $400,000, in 2006, I guarantee you it's not worth $400,000 anymore. So you, also, you have the direct control costs, but you also have the losses in property value. And we're gonna hear from our next speaker, we also have another cost, and that's on to human health. So they found in these areas, people are actually exercising less, so there's increases in cardiovascular disease, people are depressed, um, so it affects psychological and physical health too in these areas. So pretty big cost. But getting to the dollars here, and these are probably a little bit out of date because it's 2018 numbers right here, but removals can be pretty expensive, as you know. Uh, and stump grinding, if the landowner chooses to do that. Replacement, they choose to do that depending on the size of the tree and the type of the tree. And then the insecticides. Um, they work very, very well, but they can get kind of costly too, and you have to be committed. You have to reapply these every two to three years because EAB is not going to go away and you have to keep protecting your trees, but it is possible to protect a tree if you have the money and commitment to do so. So that's EAB. I want to kind of talk about a success story too. Spongy moth, we have really good tools to monitor it. There's a very strong pheromone trap that's been on the market since the 70s. And ODA and the US Forest Service and ODF to a lesser extent, we've been trapping in the state since then, since the 1970s. And so we're able to detect populations really early, and there are really good tools for eradication. So this one prefers hardwoods, but it's also known to uh, feed on conifers like Doug fir and hemlock. And so yeah, I want to stress there has been success. Um, maybe some of you old timers have been around here for a while. In Lane County, there was a huge outbreak that was uh, detected shortly after the, so this is when the traps came on the market in the late 70s. So this is when Oregon started trapping. And then in Lane County, we noticed, holy cow, we have actually a big infestation. And over a quarter million acres were treated. This is a big 
uh, undertaking at the time, and an incident management team was called, like a fire, like a fire team from ODF. A fire team managed this, and uh, all types of personnel involved. I've, I've read the, the the manuals from it; it's impressive. But they had to spray two years in a row, so they had to convince lawmakers and the public, "Yeah, we really need to do this." But they knocked out that population amazingly, and it kept Oregon free of spongy moth for decades. You can see down here, um, since we knew that it would work, every time there's a spot infestation, we're able to uh, take it out pretty quickly with an organ a labeled organic uh, pesticide, BT. So it's a foliar spray. This is a lucky one because the caterpillars feed on the leaves. And uh, so you can, you can time these sprays right when they're emerging from their eggs. They're little tiny caterpillars. You time these sprays, it's organic, and it doesn't last too long in the environment, and you're able to eradicate populations that way. Saving Oregon's tens of millions of dollars, and also think about all the landowners that would be misapplying pesticides, too. If we had permanent um, spongy moth populations, it would be pretty nasty out there. Uh, also, in 2016, our, our last eradication of spongy moth, for those of you that are around here, this is St. John's, this is Forest Park, and even over into Vancouver. Uh, this was a, another huge undertaking. I forgot how many, I think there was 90 agencies, nine zero agencies involved in this. But uh, these, in 2015, you could see all the positive detections. So a task force was developed over the winter, 2015, and by spring of 2016, uh, we pulled off a successful mission, and um, this area, I think it was about 8,000 acres, were flown by a couple of helicopters, and there's no um, spongy moth now. We eradicated that population. So, kind of in summary right here, just expect EAB to stay here, and the best thing we can do is slow the spread, and there's going to be some changes coming to our forest, including our riparian forest that I showed, and our urban forests. Uh, we have this quarantine or control area in Washington County and to start urban forest planning if you haven't done so right now. Now with Mediterranean oak borer, this is a new pest. So this is developing. Uh, we're gonna be doing intense, more intense surveys and monitoring for this. And just wanna stress that now that I've showed you what the signs and symptoms are that I would really like for you to report on, it's better to know than not know. So invasive species are, going to continue, more than likely, based on international trade. Uh, but I just want to remind everyone, this isn't the first time it's happened here in Oregon. So white pine blister rust, it completely changed the distribution of western white pine in Oregon, and it's still affecting some of our other five needle pines. It was first introduced in 1910 um, in the nursery trade, and it was the U.S.'s uh, quarantine pass number one. So this is what kick-started uh, the APHIS organization and all sorts of uh, regulations about importing goods from other countries. And that's what kickstarted a lot of stuff back in 1910 at the federal level, not, not just here in the Pacific Northwest. Then uh, Karen mentioned Balsam Area Delgid, which still, I think, at ODF were, and, and the Forest Service were mapping like 70,000 acres are affected every year. And these are, it affects these high elevation firs mostly in the Cascades, but also some Christmas tree producers as well. This is what the immature looks like, and it basically just taps into the phloem of the needles right here, and so the, the needles just get covered in this, and they create those, the plant's response is to create those galls, and grows slow and eventually dies. And poor open cedar root disease uh, was huge on the timber industry here in Oregon. That was a very vibrant uh, industry, a lot of exports going to Asia, uh, they use Portland cedar for their open beam construction, but the market dropped out when we got an invasive pathogen. And uh, you urban foresters know that Portland cedar root disease still affects our Portland cedar in urban environments here. So this one's another one that's still in landscape, still affecting us today. And then sudden oak death most recently before EAB uh, detected in Oregon. And it is an invasive pest of nursery plants and of forests. And this one has a federal quarantine still. These don't have federal quarantines anymore. Sudden Oak Death has a federal quarantine. So we have interest at the national level for this. And there's more. I can't mention them all. Spruce aphid, attacking the Sitka spruce on the coast. We map it every year in our aerial surveys. Large case for in eastern Oregon. We map that too. And, and others.
And that's just the insects and diseases, not to mention the weeds here. So how to report? Well, there's that survey one, two, three, the spot EAB, that's for agency use, but for everyone else, for businesses and individuals, we are using and promoting the hotline. And this is a public facing web page. You don't have to have a login. You don't have to sign up for anything. Luckily, you know, I hate all these emails and passwords we have to do, but this one, you can just report right now. And within 60 seconds, you can log a report of any invasive species, not just the ones I've been mentioning, but weeds or anything like that. And it goes to these hotline manager accounts. So I'm a manager. I know some other people in here are managers, and we're monitoring this. So if it flags Mediterranean oak borer, we're going to look at those pictures. And maybe we can rule it out right there, or maybe we can go respond to it later. And the nice thing about this is it lives on a map, so other agencies can see what's been reporting. trapping season is actually 16 weeks. Uh, so the traps need to be up place right now. And then it needs to be in a tree that's not going to get removed. And it needs, there, there's a trapping interval. There's a, uh, there's a method. Why I only put them up for 24 hours is because I knew the trees were coming down the next day. I was out there July 1st. I'm like, I got traps. Let's put them up. Let's see how much I can trap in 24 hours. So that's how much I trapped in 24 hours. I just wanted to stress that I caught 285 beetles in one trap in 24 hours. I meaning there's a lot of beetles. But usually, 16 weeks on, good idea, but you need the landowner permission. There's some complexities involved. Right now, the best is that Oil and Invasive Species Council hotline. If you really want to train your staff, then I would say su suggest talking to ODA to see, hey, can we get trained to use the SPOT EAB app? Well, one benefit I would say is that um, Woodpecker populations have gone up in the eastern U.S. <laughs> so woodpeckers actually provide about another 25% predation. So what? Woodpeckers, 25% predation. We are, the postoids, another 25%. So that's 50% predation. But the populations are still climbing back east. So if anything, I'm trying to struggle, what would the positives be? Well, here in Oregon, now there's um, some interest in logging Oregon ash ahead of um, the front. So that's very, very risky in my professional opinion because it's hard to detect these things and we're not going to be 100%. There's no certification program to say these logs are certified pest free. It's so hard. You have to use a draw knife and peel back the bark 360 degrees around and look for galleries. And even then, we're human, we're going to miss some. But the wood products industry, maybe I found that there are six mills in Oregon and Washington that already have the capacity to process ash. They are processing ash for hardwood flooring and other, other things. So there could be an increase, a uh, short-term increase, like a boom and bust type of thing, because it's more than likely, even with our slowing the ash mortality, that this insect is going to spread across our state um, conceivably within 20 years. So. Yeah, that's even if we're being really vigilant, don't move firewood, don't move firewood. All it takes is a couple um, truckloads to really start a new population, and then that one will take off. And once you've got a heavy population load, then there's more chances for it to spread faster. So at least based on the eastern United States, it's spread across some of these states in 10, 15, 20 years. <laughs>